start uh, with a question that came into us on Facebook. Uh, the person writes in and says, my daughter has been scratching and hitting other kids because she can't get the words out. Recently, my gym has rejected her from coming to their child center because of the scratching. I'm waiting to hear back if the behavioral therapist can be there to supervise. If they still say no, is this legally something they can do to not to deny her access? Do you have any suggestions? And I, I just have to say, a little disclaimer, that I went through the same thing where our gym him refused mm -hmm. our son for behavior that he was engaged in that the other kids that were, were doing but they knew that he had an autism diagnosis really? and, and we were refused we came with a behaviorist and they still said you can't bring him back it's a heartache for parents it is very hard I actually I don't know the legality of it but I would assume that the gym is responsible for all of the kids there and so they're just trying to take measures that would protect the other children um, and I would say you you know, you wouldn't, you don't really want your child in that environment anyway for a number of different reasons. One is, uh, well, obviously, if there are not people there who are trained to be able to help your child um, or take care of your child, um, then it's not going to be a positive experience for your child to begin with. And secondly, um, you know, a lot of times, this is why I always say, Shannon, that our kids need some intervention before they're placed in school or placed in social settings because, uh, you know, from my perspective, we also don't want our kids to just stand out or to be looked at like, oh, stay away from that kid. I mean, that's not a very positive thing altogether. So really it goes back to the concept that we've talked about several times, which is why is your child scratching other kids or hitting other kids? And that's clearly uh, because he or she can't communicate. And I think this parent also said that because yeah. um, the child yeah. can't get the words out. Exactly. And really your behaviorist, um, you know, ideally, yes, you'd want to have your behaviors there so that they can help um, generalize, but your behaviorist is not going to be able to teach the skill that's necessary in that setting. Um, that the skill that's necessary is that, you know, some other form of communication instead of scratching or hitting other kids. And the way to do that, and we've talked about this in the past as well, is just basically you block the behavior. You have to understand that your child's doing this because they're trying to say something. Yeah. Okay. They're trying to say, I, whatever, I want to get on this gym equipment and or I don't want you here or whatever it is and they can't express that so uh, they do it by hitting or scratching and when they do that behavior they're usually it's an effective response so in other words they'll scratch a child the child will leave and then they'll get to play on that equipment so it's effective so your child has learned that hey scratching other kids or hitting other kids is an effective mode of communication so you have to now reteach your child that no it's not an effective mode of communication and which would you know theoretically that means when your child hits or scratches another child the, ch the other child doesn't leave well we can't make that happen obviously right. so you have to block this response you can't allow your child to be hitting or scratching other people and you have to offer your child an easier modality of communication something that is more appropriate but easier so for instance if there's a therapist present presence with the child, they would, perhaps if your child's nonverbal, they would just have an icon where the child could say, okay, I want to play on this item, mm -hmm. or I need, whatever it is, you would have picture uh, visual graphics that represent the various things that your child might be wanting at that time. Um, and then your, your child is taught to use those, um, or verbalizations, obviously, if your child's vocal, uh, to replace the scratching. Because that the, there's too much going on in that environment, this type of thing has to be taught 
outside of the environment, sort of in a, in a smaller contained environment where your child gets to practice and then generalized to other children. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to do these things with a therapist, with behaviorists, um, either in the home, in a school setting, in a clinic setting. But your child needs practice because this is a behavior that's developed and the child needs to relearn a new behavior. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like practice the behavior. First, make sure your child even knows what that card or icon is for mm -hmm. and then start going back to the gym and implementing it in that new environment. Thank you so much because yeah. you know even when I was reading this I was taken back to that moment when the gym refused my child and the emotion of it. Oh yeah. And I remember asking the same question can they legally do that? Yeah. But what you just brought home to me was well, that's a question that you can ask. The better question is, how can I how help I my child? Yeah. And is this the right place for my child to be? And right. when somebody is saying that they don't want your child, chances are, not that, not that we in any way give up on our children, but that that isn't the best place in the moment for, for our child. kids. Yeah, and, and you know what you said, Shannon, it's so important as well. We become so defensive when mm -hmm. anything is about our kids. Yes. Anything at all, you know. Um, my 17-year-old last night was at UCLA and got a ticket in the parking. And I'm already like, I can't believe UCLA parking would give you a <laughs> ticket. You have a permit, all this, you know. <laughs> we just, we immediately protect our kids and we become so at every level right, right. And, we, and we think okay they have the right and so on but the truth is the people at the gym or the people at a school or wherever it is um, it's not like they are just mean people you know they're trying to protect the other kids and they're not trained they don't know how to manage these types of things. They don't have any idea what to do with this. Yeah. And they're probably hearing other parents who are just as protective about their own kids sure. coming and complaining. So I think these opportunities, and it's of course so hard for uh, moms and dads who have kids on the spectrum because everybody's so fast to judge our kids in yes. some way or another. But I think it's it's an important opportunity for us to learn and just say, okay, I'm getting defensive about this. Let's just look at the reality of things. And I need to work with my child outside of this environment and then get him into a gym. Yeah. And that's, it's just like, you know, it, it really isn't a positive experience for your child either. It's like throwing yeah. any other child, let's say a typically developing child into a, you know, high level math class where our child's always going to fail. Yeah. So why not tutor the child first and then introduce him to the skill that's yeah. hard? We're actually going to talk about math later because oh, we had okay. some questions about math. Um, but we had a question that came in last week that I promised we would answer today. Why do so many of our children on the spectrum suffer from seizures? Mm. Our son developed seizures when he was older and no one can tell us why. Right. And I can't tell you why either. Um, there is a higher correlation of seizure disorder with autism than probably any other childhood disorder but the reasons are generally different reasons um, the focal point of the seizure is sometimes you can they it's not even possible to identify um, their generalized seizures but the for my personal experience the majority of the kids that I've had who've had seizures is uh, focused in the temporal lobes and so any activity in the temporal lobes tends to also make our kids a little bit more impatient, a little bit more aggressive. That's just how the temporal lobes are. Um, and can't tell you, honestly. I will say that, um, you know, as a whole, first of all, you need to know it's not just autism, but we don't know enough about seizure activity. We just, the science hasn't developed that far to be able to say exactly what's causing what. Um, but if you have seen a neurologist, if you've done uh, various tests, scans, EEG for sure, and perhaps even the CAT scan or PET scan, um, or even an MRI, you will, you know, have, make, be sure that there's no physical problems that are happening. Right. It's, so it's basically maybe a chemical problem or a biochemical mm -hmm. issue. And um, I guess prior to trying seizure medications or anticonvulsants, a lot of the parents will do various diets just that say, help seizures. More more and they are successful. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're successful and yeah. sometimes they're not. And, you know, if you see your neurologist, they will suggest the various diets too as well. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Great, great advice. And one more question that came in last week that we didn't get to was how do you test for enzyme deficiencies? There are tests um, and depending on where you are, 
Um, you know, I always recommend the uh, physicians who were originally part of the Autism Research Institute, or they used to be called Dan Doctors, mm -hmm. and now I think they're called uh, maps. The maps. Yeah, yes. a lot of those physicians will very easily do those tests for you. So I would suggest that you can um, look online, and I would imagine I'm not even sure if they have a roster right now, but I know all of the. Uh, instructors at MAPS, mm -hmm. like Dr. Rosignol and all, all the instructors, Dr. Usman, depending on where you are, they're pretty much spread all through the country. Um, all of those guys would be able to easily do these tests. And I believe you can actually, I'm not sure if it's a urine test or a blood test, but you can certainly get new, uh, deficiencies. Okay, looked great at. Advice. Yeah. And we'll put the, the link to the MAPS site up on our right, Facebook. Right, right. So we'll and they are really all over the country, so it shouldn't be yeah. too hard for you to get to see one of them. Yeah. You shouldn't have to travel too far. Okay, I think it's a great time for us to take a break. We're going to come back with a bunch more questions after these messages. Stick with us. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampuche, a true visionary in the field of Thank autism. Thank you very much. So thrilled to have you here. We have a question that just came in on our live feature. Uh, Hi, Dr. Doreen. How do you teach a child to defend themselves without becoming aggressive? I'm all ears on, on your answer to this. Yeah, well, this is one of those things that's... Um, I mean, we teach this in our program, but we teach it sort of a little bit later in the program mm -hmm. because it's one of those um, social rules that are very hard for our kids to be able to identify. Um, I mean, we actually teach our kids to be more assertive in yeah. certain environments. And it is difficult because if you teach a child very early on how to defend themselves, what you're doing is you're... It, let's let's break that down together. Mm -hmm. Let's do a little task analysis. Yeah. So in order to defend yourself, the first thing you have to do is identify what the scenario is in which you should defend yourself. Mm -hmm. In other words, am I actually uh, being attacked in some way? Am I being mocked in some way? Um, am I being bullied in some way? And see, all of those things are very, very abstract concepts. Um, so even if we just focus on bullying, like how do you teach a child to identify someone that would be classified as a bully, let's say, mm -hmm. right? It's very difficult. It's yeah. very different because, I mean, you have bullies that are the classic sort of bully that you see on TV or mm -hmm. whatever. But then you, you could also have a child whose best friend is, is in a very subtle way bullying them and, yeah. and you know, not treating them well. So these are very... Um, advanced concepts that you can't really teach to the child when they're very young or when they haven't entered, when they don't have some other prerequisite skills in mm -hmm. place already. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand, Shannon, with all the area where we teach our kids to identify other people's facial expressions, understand oh. intentions. Mm -hmm. That's like, you know, your child has to have had some practice with the theory of mind programming and all the perspective taking because how do you know someone else is intending to be mean right. if you can't see their perspective? Right. It's all kind of related to more basic things that have to be in place. So that's why if your child is not at that area, you know, not hasn't reached that yet, you really need to have an aide or a shadow or someone mm -hmm. watching over your child so they identify right. the scenarios. Now, if the, that's so that's just stage one it's like <laughs> identifying the scenario yeah once you've identified or if the, and that's so either you have someone else just pointing out to your child like he shouldn't have said that to you or that was a mean thing to say mm -hmm. so or your child can identify those things themselves they've passed that stage then the next stage is what's an appropriate response and yeah. so the appropriate response is stuff that you can practice with your child obviously and you know Let's face it, sometimes defending yourself is aggressive, mm -hmm. but it's appropriate in a social norm if if it's in defense of yourself, right? Yeah. So it keeps going back to that original thing, which is, hey, it is appropriate for my child to push someone if that person is beating them up. Yes. But it's not appropriate for my child to push someone if that someone is passively standing there. You know right. what I mean? And, and different even because you mentioned intention because sometimes a child can push another child because... Accidentally, yeah, for Exactly. Instance. That's yes. right. I mean, I remember I had a child who was really, really upset because somebody had... 
uh, knocked down his uh, backpack and uh -huh. he thought it was an intentional act. Right. So really teaching our kids to defend themselves, is, it's not so much about teaching them the, the ways to defend themselves. So it's much more about learning scenarios that require defending yourself. That's the harder part. Yeah. Because once you've learned that sort of stuff, then you will only use those behaviors when it's appropriate. Yeah. Now, of course, other factors, like if our child doesn't have enough language, how is he going to defend himself? Is it because then you know, he has the propensity to become more physical and more aggressive. So obviously if the child has language, that helps, that should be a prerequisite skill. So what do we do for our kids that don't have language? If a teacher is watching them or if an aide is watching them and a situation happens, then all you can really expect of, the ch of your child at that time is to go to the teacher mm -hmm. and perhaps give a card or give an icon or something so that our, our child starts to get into the habit of identifying when he or she is being hurt mm -hmm. and letting someone know. Yeah. I mean, that's like the minimum thing you want to teach. And then at the very high end of the, of, let's say, development or the spectrum or learning, mm -hmm. right, once you've learned a bunch of skills, then it's identifying d all different scenarios that you're being aggressed against or bullied or made fun of or mm -hmm. whatever it is. And then identifying multiple multiple appropriate behaviors that could be done in those situations mm -hmm. and then doing them but you know and then again the age of the child so if it's a younger child you want to teach the child to go to the teacher if it's an older child that's not even a good thing because that'll provoke more bullying you know so yeah. there's too much in here that has to be taught so really what I'm saying is you know there's a series of and if you're interested again on skills we have all, this entire series of I think it's in the social career curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it's in the social domain area and it's uh, listed under, I think it's listed under assertiveness training. Mm -hmm. And so it's teaching the child how to be assertive without being aggressive. And again, it's like any other behavior. If you teach a behavior, um, let's say, you know, behaviors can be maladaptive or a adaptive, mm -hmm. the same exact behavior. So as I gave the example of pushing someone, it can be maladaptive or it can be adaptive. Yeah. Um, let's say screaming, it could be maladaptive if you're just screaming in the classroom or whenever you feel like it, it's quite adaptive if you're screaming when you see a fire. Right. <laughs> you know? So the, the same behavior, it has to do with the appropriateness of the environment environment and when it occurs. Those types of things you really have to teach one at a time to the child. Wow. Very it's exciting lot, though. Right? It is a lot, but it's exciting to think that there is a roadmap for it. There's definitely a roadmap. It takes a while. I, these are harder concepts. Yeah. So you wouldn't even be really working on these concepts unless the child's over five or six. Yeah. Um, child has to have some prerequisite, you know, basic skills, some language ability, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And if they don't, then really you're depending on the adults around the child to help protect them. Yeah. And I have to also say on that, Shannon, that I feel one of the positive things that I'm seeing happen just over time, mm -hmm. you know, there, there was this, and it's improved. It isn't completely better, but it's improved quite a bit. And I think it just has to do with one is there's so many kids being diagnosed that now that people are, I guess, more familiar yeah. with it. And the second thing is that there's so many different movements out there about bullying and mm -hmm. what happens to kids in high schools and all this sort of stuff that I think as a whole, children have become more empathetic to our kids. Yeah. I mean, I see this in my kids' schools and they they, are, they have much more of a, although they're not comfortable yet, right. I wouldn't say other kids are fully comfortable with our kids yet, but they're more empathetic, that's for sure. You know, they're not, they, there's less bullying and less of that sort of thing going on than there were a few years ago. Which is amazing to think yeah. because Thank there's God. still work that needs to be done, but uh, encouraging to see the, that needle move a little bit and I would you know if one of the things I'd love to I'd be very passionate about is training typically developing kids so that they yes. understand more about this well it really is a part of the problem oh, I, absolutely. you know we we can spend a whole lot of time front-loading our children to be able to deal with all these di different situations but unfortunately in some cases they're gonna come up against kids who didn't have any training neurotypical right. kids right. about how to behave appropriately right. that's always gonna be the case exactly uh, frustrating but you know at, I think you're exactly right 
right with these bullying programs more and more information is out there hopefully yeah it I mean it, this help. is really a good actually I keep saying this but there's just such a little you know I need five lives to do all the things <laughs> I want to do. but we have so many of our little guys here that are now like seven eight you know like your, yes. your son they're all they're these guys are so great at the age they are and they would be fabulous for going to elementary schools and just talking about the experience and so on. And you I think know? that they would enjoy it. It is it is an interesting thing. Yeah. I, I will say that because uh, Gem is nine now mm -hmm. and I'm noticing the difference in the kids in this age range. Mm -hmm. That they, uh, and I certainly have been talking to different people about it, that they're in this phase where everybody has to act aloof to be mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. So they're not bothered by anything. They're not, oh, you know, they're gosh. above it all. And I I don't want to teach him that. No. No, but, and you know but what? But he has to be able to cope with but, their aloofness. Right. But you know what? Even amongst his friends, there will be those kids who are more sensitive, mm -hmm. um, not as aloof, yeah. much more sort of into being a good human. Yes. And those are the kids you're going to find. He's going to find. Yes. He's going to find kids who are similar to him. He's, you know, he's going to find kids that are going to be just more empathetic. Yes. more sensitive, more caring. And like I've said many times, our kids, um, as they recover, just are beautiful human beings. Yes. And they don't have anything. They have very, very little bad and they don't they don't they're just lovely kids you know they're pure yeah. and that whole thing of pretending yeah uh that when you know that they're they're not they're feeling something that they're not feeling our kids don't have yeah or just being tough yeah. well i mean being tough you know kids 10 9 10 and so on acting tough yeah. is just putting up a wall because you have so many defenses yeah and our kids don't have those defenses because we've been all over them for four years or something by <laughs> yeah, that exactly. Point. So they're just very open to learning exactly. and open to the environment and to, they're trusting. They're much more trusting of other people. And so that's kind of, you know, he will find friends that are and like he has. him. Like he him, has. Yeah. He does have a couple of friends yeah. that are just, that are not. Uh, it's interesting though that I see them all being characterized as kids who are a little bit not as mature as the other ones. And I'm thinking, no, really, I think no. they're bypassing this uh, phase that you're calling maturity that's really not a fun phase, it's quite not, honestly. It, yeah, it's not maturity. It is confusion, if you ask me. Yeah. I think it's the phase that a lot of kids go through where they are afraid of other people knowing truly who they are. Yeah. So they fake, they're, they're pretty, like they don't really want anyone to get too close because uh, they have to have this persona of being really tough or I don't and know And everything's what, okay. And everything's okay and that kind of stuff and who cares and whatever yeah. and all right. that just because um, they don't, they just, they have a hard time letting anyone in. Yeah. And that's just because they, there's, you know, they're not comfortable with themselves. So they right. don't think other people would be, would uh, praise them for who they really are. Yeah. And those children I find don't know how to language how they're feeling. Oh, yeah. My child will say, and sometimes he'll language it for me or somebody else. Right. He'll say, well, I think you're feeling frustrated right now. <laughs> does he? <laughs> he does. And I go, yes, that's exactly what yeah, mommy awesome. is feeling. Thank you for putting that in words for me. Um, you know, and, and I think sometimes uh, other children don't necessarily appreciate not that. But, <laughs> or you know. if they do know it, they're not, they haven't been, um, they haven't been allowed to express it. Yeah. So, and I feel bad for them about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is different parenting styles. Yes. I mean, you know, yes, a lot of our true. parents here tell me that when they go through this whole thing, it changes not only their lives and their child's life, but future siblings, you know, yes. because your whole experience changes and you don't let anything go anymore. Like you see your child angry for a week, you'll sit down and have oh, a conversation yeah. and figure out why. Exactly. And typical in typical families, people don't really give it the time. They don't they're not as focused on the individual details of their kids. Yeah. So, you know, I mean that's one of the benefits that I think a lot of our parents don't realize. It's yeah. like we're we're all trained to be really good behavior analysts, psychologists, like not let anything go. Yeah. And as, as a result of that, our kids learn to share and talk and yeah. work through their issues much better. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 
and as you said, it is it is incredible parent training. Yeah, you know, that was the first thing that somebody said to me when they sent me to the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. You're going to get the best parent training you can find anywhere in the oh, world. That's and I awesome. certainly found that to be that's the, great. The, the truth. Okay, we got a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, uh, okay. We have math questions, which I'm going to get to. Hi, Dr. Doreen. Do kids who get really better using ABA have a different style of learning than those who do get ABA but not as much progress? Uh, by style, I mean factors such as learning at a faster pace, understanding concepts quickly, etc. Thank you so much. Um, you know, my um, I have rarely so all of our kids uh, uh, respond in different ways. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are some kids that will go through these programs like just you know it's just their language it is, um, and other kids will have problems. But their problem the kids who have a few problems it has more to do with their sensory needs I find than just their ability or their style of learning. I would say this is the style of learning uh, across all human beings. Mm -hmm. ABA, the, the original name for applied behavior analysis was behavior modification and behavior modification uh, f falls under, fell under and still falls under an area of psychology called learning psychology. Uh -huh. So it is the number one way that human beings learn operant conditioning that's just a fact so um, it's not about your child's learning style if I had to guess it's I would say it's about one or the other one thing or another and my first um, I guess I would lean towards first saying it's the ABA program so the program there's many many components that have to be ideal in the program and we'll talk about that and the second thing it could be is possibly your child's sensory abilities because and i'll talk about that real quickly because that's easier sensory what i mean is some kids will learn better if something is provided to them visually other because th that's just because they have a hard time with differentiating sounds figure mm -hmm. ground discrimination of sounds or uh, hearing with uh, sounds at the same pace with both uh, ears um, other kids will have a harder time with visual material just because their perception visual perception has problems binocularity they're not focused whatever it is but, um, and other kids will have other sensory issues like tactile proprioceptive issues that are just disturbing. They kind of keep them on an anxious level because their skin feels like it's crawling or something like that. So the sensory stuff is very important to take care of because that really does, not only does it help your child be able to focus better, but it also helps to make your child um, just calmer and more attentive and then you know that the material being presented is being presented in a way that your child can receive. It's like I'm not going to um, have a child learn reading when there's problems with their vision. It's like you know how much can I actually read if I don't have my glasses on. It's the same thing. So sensory input is extremely important to evaluate. Now going back to the ABA program. First of all the um, program has to be very fluid. First of all, let's back up and say the pro program has to be appropriate. So one of the components is the modality, which means you've taken into account the sensory needs of the child. So, and so you're using materials and so on. I mean, I've changed materials for a child where I've like presented a material, some stimulus that's this big, and it's like uh, given to the, or put in front of the child, the child won't respond at all. Mm -hmm. If the material, if the stimulus is this big and it's presented this way, the child's responding every single trial. So right. you have to play with that. Um, second thing is the intensity. I have so many parents telling me that ABA just didn't really work for my child. And then I'll ask them more about it and I'll find out that people have the perception that ABA is like speech therapy, so you should be doing maybe two hours a week of ABA. And I've said before, don't even waste your time with that because it's not the same thing. This is about intensive teaching, intensive teaching, because there's so many concepts that you have to catch your child up to. Yeah. So that has probably the most to do with the speed of acquisition mm -hmm. and how fast you're 
your child's learning is how many hours is your child getting and you know the traditional concept is it has to be if your child's over three um, then you're looking at and you know is in that early intensive phase you're looking at somewhere between 30 to 40 hours a week of yeah. therapy so people find that hard to believe but that's the dosage that works yeah and then there's all these other factors like is your child being reinforced adequately in fact does he even have reinforcers that are meaningful is there enough motivation are the programs being taught and presented in a gradual hierarchy so that your child's not being given things that are too complex without the prerequisite skills being taught first um, is is there a balance of fairness in terms of demand and reward for the child? That's like a huge thing. Sometimes there's way too much reward, not enough demand, the child gets bored. Sometimes there's too much demand, not enough reward, and the child is aggressive, becomes aggressive because they're just, they, they're helpless, they can't win. There's all these factors. So the more important thing is your ABA program. If, spend some time really evaluating that. Um, I think if you go on our website, there's one of the links goes to something we wrote a long time ago about how to evaluate your ABA provider. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff about that. So that is a very key component, I think. And that's very helpful because for a lot of us, we don't know what to compare it to. Right. And people right. do write in and ask all the time, how do I know if my ABA provider is good? So that's a really helpful document. Um, and finding that mix, as you were saying, I didn't know when we were uh, having our early intervention from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, I didn't know how lucky I was. I didn't know how good oh, I had it. Kind of you. And then I would hear other parents in my same community with children at the same school as my son talking about their their therapy. And there was one example that really brought it, brought it home for me that somebody was saying, oh, we had a really rough day of therapy yesterday. My son hit the therapist, and so the therapist had to leave for the day and therapy was over. <laughs> and I okay. was appalled. I said the therapist left because your child aggressed. Right. Um, because that would never have happened. No, of course not. Um, Our therapists, there's no way they would leave. That's part of what they're trained to do. Exactly. And that what the child learned in that moment, is, to my way of thinking, was, hey, if I don't want to do therapy today, I will hit the therapist. I right. found something that works. That's right. That's and, right. you know, and for people who would say, oh, they only come and play with my child. They never do anything else but play. And people who say they only come and drill. And, I know. I, it was shocking to me. Yeah, uh, well, there has to be a really good balance. I mean, we spend so much time on our therapists and on our supervisors. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny because somebody was asking me um, last night about the regulations here and whether or not I feel that it would be appropriate to allow bachelor's level people to supervise cases. Mm -hmm. And I said, honestly, I know that a lot of providers want that, but I don't because I just, the, you're, you have the life of a child in your hands and you have to have a certain level of training. And when I say that, I also have, you know, we hire uh, board certified people in for supervision and we're expanding pretty pa fast. So we're hiring a lot of BCBAs and they have to go through a bunch of training here which is like three to six months of training depending on how good they are when they come in and some of the BCBAs who come in are quite offended by the fact that we they have to go through our training mm -hmm. otherwise they can't work here and um, and they're actually they have a lot of oversight in their first year overall because these are the things that are important it's like <clears throat> taking into consideration all of the factors having to do with the child, but then also being able to be flexible in your programming, modify things, because every child's different. Yeah. And it, the, every family is different. So you can't go into a family that has, you know, four kids, two of them with problems, and just make a whole bunch of strict demands because, hey, the family's falling apart. You know, right. let's help as much as we can here within our constraints. So right. some of these things are really just has to do with the provider. And it's hard. It's very hard. It is hard. But I appreciate how you guys do it and how you take into consideration Thank the individual you. family and the individual child and our time. That the fact that and our goals for our individual children and, and that you get that you have our child's right. life in your hands and that we don't get so. this time over again. Right. And that's the thing that I want to remind parents. You don't. You don't get this time. You don't get to do do-overs. And so many parents will that, uh, that I've met that have eventually switched a card and said, I wish I had that year yeah, back. Miracle. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, that's okay, though. I mean, we're very fortunate in that we are now 
growing fast enough to be able to clear our waiting lists faster. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not quite there yet, and each of the offices have a number of kids waiting, which really always disturbs me. But we are we are able to take on more of the kids, and so they don't have to wait to transfer in. And you know, CART is not by any means the only place that has this type of thing going on. It really has to do with the maturity of the supervisor, I think, the overall understanding. I find a lot of my supervisors are really much better once they have their own kids. They yes. become a little bit more open-minded about it. <laughs> but in general, I think um, you should probably, as a parent who's out there and not quite clear about how things are going, you should maybe shop around a little bit mm -hmm. and see if your child progresses faster with another provider. And, mm -hmm. and again, the most important thing is the actual hours, I would say, the dosage. It's like I always say if someone, the physician gives you a, a medication and says 25 milligrams, you're not going to expect an effect if you do 5 milligrams. Right. It's the same thing here. Absolutely. Great time for us to take a break. We're going to come back with more questions. You can keep them coming in. And uh, like I said, we'll be back after, these after this break with Dr. Doreen Grampuche. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampuche, who is truly an expert in the field of autism and has been working in this field for Thank multiple you. decades. I hate to say how long because yeah. nobody would believe it. <laughs> but uh, we have a question about medication um, that uh, we'll ask you and you can see if you'd like to answer it. Hi, Dr. Doreen. What are your thoughts with Zoloft to help with anxiety? Plus, our six-year-old son uh, takes clonidine to help him to get to a relaxing point to fall asleep, but he still wakes up on and off throughout the night. What are your thoughts? Thank you. I'm not really supposed to be giving you medical advice here because I'm not a physician, but I will tell you my personal feelings about both of those medications. Um, clonidine, in general, I would suggest that you try to get your child off of clonidine if you can. I don't know if you've tried melatonin for sleep, if you have understood. I mean, sometimes it just nothing works with our kids other than something as strong as clonidine. Um, but there is a particular brand of melatonin that I like, that I use because I travel a lot, um, and it really works for me, and it's called Tranquil Sleep, and you can order it from Amazon. And it's a combination of melatonin with uh, tryptophan and theanine, and it's really good. It, it's much, much more effective, and it's a chewable, and it tastes really good, so our kids love it. Um, and for kids, it's usually just one tablet chewable. For adults, it's two. But so that's what I would suggest for the sleep. Um, for and that's what I do. But for for the Zoloft, Zoloft is one of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so an SSRI. And there's a whole body of them, right? There's many, many um, varieties like Prozac and Luvox and Paxil and so on. Um, and now there's even a new, new group of, which is not just this SSRIs, which is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, but they're also SNRIs, which are the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And what they're doing is they inhibit reuptake. So really what that means is your neurotransmitter, like let's say serotonin, which is traveling from one nerve to another nerve, um, so this nerve produces serotonin, the other nerve is supposed to take it and keep going, and that's how your uh, neurotransmitters travel. Um, and the synapse, the area in between the two nerves, uh, is you know at some point full of serotonin before this one takes it up. Now, as the new nerve is receiving this information, the one that just produced it has this other cell called a reuptake cell, and it mm -hmm. just sucks the excess amount back into it. So the effect of that, that's normal human functioning. And the effect of it is that if, if serotonin stays in the synapse too long, the nerve that just produced it will take it back, basically. Mm. These reuptake inhibitors, they prevent that. Okay. So the serotonin sits there in the nerve uh, synapse longer so that the next nerve cell can just take it and go with it. So it allows you to more efficiently use your what own you neurotransmitters. And so it's kind of a misnomer to say it increases your serotonin levels. It doesn't. It just reduces the blocking of serotonin. Okay. So as an effect, you have higher. Serotonin is the medication that controls anxiety, obviously, and depression and all those types of things. Norepinephrine is the one that will is more related to other states of emotion, affect, higher level affect. But 
Having said that, do I feel that these medications are good? Personally, I do. I've seen a tremendous amount of change with my kids. When you have, and I am a strong, strong believer that a lot of our kids have anxiety and at all levels. Like I think that when they're very little or if they are um, even very little. I mean, I always talk to the parents and I say, just imagine how you would feel if you had the following things going on with you. You weren't sleeping. Just really, as I go through this list, put yourself in that state. Yeah. You're not sleeping. Uh, a lot of things that you eat give you discomfort. That's the case with a lot of our kids. Mm -hmm. um, you're not understanding what's going on what you want except mm -hmm. for certain ways like screaming and crying and tantruming or whatever mm -hmm. um, you are in a heightened response state to stimuli it's kind of like when you're jet lagged I mm -hmm. guess um, or if you've had 20 cups of coffee or something mm -hmm. and like lights bother you sort of uh, people with migraines express this whole feeling as well lights disturb you sounds come in too loud or it's all this stuff so it's, you have sensory overload you're exhausted because you're not sleeping you have some medical issues GI perhaps or other I mean just GI itself for our kids yeah. who have GI problems I mean just imagine if you had diarrhea five times a day how would yeah. you feel you know yeah. so given all of that all of these actually make people feel anxious that's just a fact okay. I, all these things you're describing it sounds yeah. like an autism parent going to an IEP meeting oh absolutely <laughs> and hey, we, we experience all that going right. to an IEP that's meeting right. so and, we can relate and, we can you relate. Have, and you have anxiety that's, yes. that's the thing and now that's and it's gibberish we don't understand we don't feel like we have a <laughs> and you have exactly. no control right. it's all that right. same thing right but the thing is that's a, a moment of anxiety and it's it's periodic and it's over right yeah and do you know how tired you feel the day after oh, that or that yes. afternoon or evening right so anxiety actually burns up a lot of glucose so you're exhausted after that our kids have a chronic level of that stuff going on mm. right because they're in this world of their own so they develop habits to help them control their environment mm. um, lining up objects or doing ritualistic repetitive behaviors because those are the compulsions mm -hmm. that make us feel more in control of things you know that our kids lose it when their activities are suddenly changed or yeah. their schedule is changed or all that's anxiety yeah. so how do you treat anxiety and I um, and you know all by the way I've said this before just so for people to know when we refer to obsessive compulsive behavior mm -hmm. which we also in behavioral terms we call it self stimulatory or stereotypic ritualistic behavior and all comes from anxiety now the treatment for anxiety, a lot of literature shows that the best possible outcome for anxiety is a combined treatment of cognitive, behavioral, and medication. Mm -hmm. So cognitive, behavioral on its own works, medication on its own works, the best is the combination. Mm -hmm. And the medications are generally the SSRIs. So depending on the age of your child, we active at that dose. However, one of the things you need to know about the SSRI is to show an effect. If, it, if he or she doesn't respond, then there's, you should try the other ones. Like you okay. need to very, very well, okay. and one won't. And that's just because of the chemical shape that, of the reuptake. This kind of makes our kids a little bit less uh, on edge, a little bit less afraid. Uh, a little bit braver, a little bit calmer. It, it helps okay. a lot with the teaching. Okay, great. Yeah. I promised we would talk about a math question that came sure. yesterday. Sure. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday, but we, we all agreed that we wanted your take on it. Uh, there's really two parts to the question because a parent had written in and said that their child is has good math skills mm -hmm. um, and is, is very good at being able to do math questions for homework, but when it comes to a word problem that there seems to be difficulty with the comprehension sorting out and taking the problem if she if the mom goes through and sorts out the problem they can do the math component of it but the comprehension part of it and and then further it, it morphed into a conversation about having to do the steps with math mm -hmm. and how frustrating that is for a lot of our kids because they want to trot ahead and they're in a classroom where they're asking to see the steps mm -hmm. so we wanted to get your take on teaching math to our kids both from the comprehension 
comprehension standpoint mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a component that needs to be used in math and how we might work on comprehension and then the frustration of doing the steps right so I guess this is no different than any other child, I would say. And so these are really three components. One is the comprehension of the, uh, what are they, math equations or something. And then one is the actual taking the steps, which the steps are pre-identified. I mean, you can, within each type of thing, there's always the same series of steps. So you can pretty much help the child by writing out sort of a a framework of these are the steps. And with math, by the way, we use a lot of visual, uh, just written material diagrams and so on for the child to be able to comprehend the stuff. So I would suggest you definitely do write out the steps. So every time you have a math question, these are the things you have to do. And the first thing you have to do is be able to understand the math question and turn it into a basic equation, obviously. Mm -hmm. So when you read a math question that's uh, what are they called? Like the you know, word problems. Word problems. You know, Jim like, is walking three problems. miles in this direction, exactly. while Betsy is walking fourteen in the other exactly. direction. Exactly. So, what we do generally, and and the, so, I think if a child is good at the equation part of it, this is more about the comprehension of the actual word problem. So, have your child draw it out. Just okay. have them draw it out, and just say, okay, this is Jim and he's walking, okay? And he's either walking this way or this way, but draw a line showing where he's walking. Mm-hmm. And then how, how long is he walking? Okay, three miles. Immediately, if the child, and the third component that I wanted to say is the core stuff, the mm-hmm. core stuff. When I was teaching my kids math, I realized that there are some little things that you can teach your kids that really, really help okay. forever. Obviously, our kids have to be extremely fluid with and flexible and really good at like math, you know, multiplication, yeah. addition, and all that sort of stuff. So we want to make sure they're really good at that. The other thing that really helps them is the units of measurement help them identify what it is they're looking for. So when you write miles, and if your child has memorized that these are all units of measurement of distance, whether it's kilometers or miles or in, whatever it is, inches, yeah. yeah, inches and shorter, and you you actually physically in life show them these units mm-hmm. of measurement, that helps comprehension of word uh, problems so much more. So Jim is walking three miles, you, your child will immediately know this is distance. Okay. And so all you have to do is draw a line and you write three miles. Or if it's like, you know, um, so-and-so went and bought six oranges, well then have your child just draw them, okay, six oranges. This uh-huh. is quantity. Right. And so all, and then if they draw it out, it's very easy underneath it to write the equation, yeah. you know. so. If he bought three and he gave away two, that so just draw a person, he's giving away these two to another person. So, and giving away right. is the symbol minus. Right. Certain words actually are exact equivalents to equation things. Right. So, you know, he had a quantity of five, he gave away minus sign, two of them. Right. So what is that? And that equals, you know, whatever it is. So make it as visual as possible. What One of the things with both my son and my, do- my youngest daughter, and my oldest daughter, actually, when we were doing math initially together when they were younger, I would get so frustrated, especially with my son, because kids have the tendency to not use any paper. Like, they'll have one nice. screen, and they want to write it all on the margin, <laughs> and they want to write it tiny. Right, right. And I can't do math if that's yeah. the case. I need almost the full page for any equation. Yeah. Like, I really do. And so I will just pull out scrap paper, and I'm like, no, write it big. Write all the things you understand from it, yeah. and let's figure out the stuff you're missing from it, and let's yeah. make it visual. And I will tell you, like, just doing that, I remember my oldest daughter, when she was just in um, starting middle school, so sixth grade, I remember she was starting, I think, with pre-algebra or something, and pre-algebra, obviously, is all equations. So we sat together, and she was just, like, hated it. She was like, I hate math. I can't stand math. This is horrible. I'm never going to get math, blah, blah, blah. And we did all this stuff, and I have to tell you, she is, like, so superior in math. She takes, you know, she is, like, by far 
far past anything I would ever understand. She's done like advanced placement calculus. You know, she's wow. crazy now, of course, having finished high school. But I mean, she took, I think she took the AP exam in, in math because she's so strong in math now. And it was simply just being able to not fear it and, and like, you know, draw it so that you can understand exactly what it's saying to you. It's the same concept as what we do with language with our kids who don't understand. We use like the concepts of thought and we use these uh, comic strips that we draw out the yeah. comic strips. So and so said this, the other person felt this. Mm -hmm. And all we really do is we have one dialogue in the head, which is what they think, one in the heart, which is how they feel, you know? Right. And so you just make it visual and it'll make it easier for the child. Okay. And reinforcing when they also do the steps too. Oh, well, there's no question. You and Yeah, listing the steps. So you always draw it out first, yeah. draw the equation, solve the equation, you know, whatever. And as you get more complex your steps will increase yeah but yeah and then rewarding the child for a gradual approximations and I love the fact that you say, well, of course. But for us yeah. as parents, we go, right, I got to remember. How do I make that <laughs> right? But it's like, you know, like, so uh, let's just forget that it's math for a minute. Yeah. Like, let's just say brushing your teeth. Yeah. Like, one of the things that I do for a lot of, for my own kids, I did this, uh -huh. right? So you want them to brush their teeth and get ready in the morning. So what's the easiest way? Do you really want to stand there and tell them step by step every morning? No. I took a picture of my child doing every step. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I put the picture in a row and then I stood there and I said, what do you have to do first? What's next? What's next? And then I didn't have to stand there anymore. Yeah. So what are you doing with taking pictures and putting them in a row? You're writing out the steps. steps. Yeah. So that's all it is, you know, and then after a while, they just think it's really cute and you take the pictures away and they know what they're doing. It's amazing. This is why yeah. I say this is the best parent training that there is available yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that quite honestly does not occur to me. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and from our end, it's just, we don't think of it any other way because that's right. how we've lived our whole lives is break right. things down yeah. into small chunks, make sure they're successful. That's a big thing I find with kids with math. Like I am very thankful somehow my kids all get math, but yeah. they're uh, actually, I think even my um, son now who's in ninth grade is pretty much like doing math that's hard for me to comprehend yeah. sometimes. They go in advanced math very fast. But I have to say, um, the biggest part I found is that in general, they fear math mm. uh, to begin with. And they think it's a very hard subject. Yeah. And it's not. I think with math, you have to take the fear out of it for okay. kids. I, with my kid, yeah, and I always, I'm sorry, I always take it back to my kid, sure. but it's what I know. Um, he doesn't fear math. He just is convinced that he has a better, faster way to do it in his head. And he doesn't want to do the steps. Um, but he will. I, I, I just, I think I, the key for me that I learned here is that I just have to make that part more reinforcing to him. And I might have to bring something from outside to make it more reinforcing. If I make yeah. it a song, he like, that's reinforcing. That's what we had to do with spelling. If I, if I, you know, make something else to go with, he just wants to do it in his head. Do you know what you should do? But does he get it correct in his head? Sometimes. Now that we're getting into multiple um, numbers and more complicated math. It's getting harder. He will get, yeah, it's getting harder for him. Okay. And so he does have to do this steps. Right. So why don't you just talk to his teacher mm -hmm. and tell his teacher to require uh, that he shows his work. Oh, she has been on the oh, she has been on him. He just doesn't want to. And he'll go, I don't want to. But does he know the steps? Does he know exactly he what the steps are? He does know the steps. Are? But to him, that's like crazy. Why can't I just do it in my head? Right. <laughs> you know, he's probably he's probably sharper and he's at the phase of figuring out the next stage. Yes. But um, just count off the steps and uh, reward him for additional steps. Yeah, I mean, let's just break it down and reward them.